nice thing. Okay. Okay, so we are um, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties with iCompass, so we're doing, uh, we're old school tonight and taking uh, manually right now, so mm -hmm. that's what we're doing. So um, anyway, um, Kelly, we'll let you jump in. This is, um, I'll confess, this is awesome, um, right out of the gate. Um, I can't wait to hear the background, but I was looking through the slides and the, the personalization you did was, was pretty solid. It doesn't surprise me, but it was pretty neat. Thank you. I'm a little nervous, but I'll calm down. Oh, you're good. So you're nervous. good. Okay, um, and I, wasn't, I didn't print this out, so I'm going to kind of work off this. Okay. If I wander that way, will it still pick me up? The mic? Yeah, yeah we should be okay. okay. All right, so um, I'm Kelly Smith, city assessor. And before we leave here, in a short amount of time, or before I leave here, um, you're gonna, I'm going to answer these questions. What is an assessment or assessed value? What is personal property? How do we handle Michigan tax tribunal appeals? What is a principal residence exemption? And a bunch more. So get ready. Okay. So assessment administration is one of the three broad statutory duties that is the state mandates for the local units. The other two are elections and tax collections. So tax collections and assessing go hand in hand. Um, Assessing in a nutshell is to locate and identify every single property, taxable property within the city or township. And then we have to fairly and equi equitably value all these properties. Okay, um, in the state of Michigan, we assess at 50% of fair market value. And there's also other values that, have, that come into play. So AV assessed value is 50% of the market value. Taxable value came about after the proposal in 1994, and um, that puts a cap on how much your taxes can increase over the year. So taxable value can only go up cost of living, whatever cost of living is for the year, while market value can skyrocket like it's doing now. Uh, taxable value only is it's capped. So there's capped versus uncapped, and the capped is the taxable value, only going up so much. And there's also... Um, a transfer, when a, when, a, when a house sells or any kind of property sells, it's called a transfer, and the taxable value uncaps the following year of the transfer, so it catches up to the assessed value that following year. Um, we, I, there's also new and losses, new additions, new building, new construction, losses if you take something down. Um, then the millage is applied to the taxable value. Uh, most properties, especially in the market today, we're seeing a large gap between the assessed and taxable values, just because the market is so high. And then we also have true cash value, which is the same thing as fair market value. And SEV, which is state equalized value, that's the assessed value with any county or state equalization factor applied. This hardly ever happens. It's the, if the assessor isn't doing the job and raising the values up the way they should, then that, that comes into play. <coughs> Sorry. All right, so, so just to give you an example on how taxes are calculated, I just took a, like a $200,000 home, so the TV would be half of it, just assuming that the TV is half of it. You apply the millage, this is, I applied 30 mils, that's not what ours are more in the 40s, and then you divide it by 1,000 and that gives you $3,000 worth of taxes, property taxes. Um, there's all kinds of classes of property here in Walker. We have residential, commercial, industrial, and exempt. There's also agricultural, developmental, and timber cutover. We don't have any of that. And you need to know that class and zoning are not hand in hand. So we have a lot of stuff that's still zoned agricultural, but all of our agricultural properties are in the res class, residential. <coughs> still trying to calm down. All good. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> Deep breath. Deep breath. You're amongst friends. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to go over the assessing cycle, the, the main points in the assessing cycle. And then I'm going to start with building permits. If someone comes in, building a contractor or a builder comes in to get the permit, and then the community de development department issues the permit. And we get a copy of that permit. We enter all the information into our system. Our system is BSNA. It's almost everybody in the state uses that. And then um, we pull those blueprints or the plans, and then we have to draw a sketch of the house in our system on the APEX software. That's a sketch program. And so we need to know these two APEX and BSNA. We need to know those two sim, sim systems. And we also need to be able to read blueprints and plans. 
And um, I have provided some samples, your own personal samples. The first page is one and two. is a record card of your own home, if you're in the locker. Pages three and possibly three A, that's the apex sketch of your home. So that part is personalized for you. Okay, next comes field work. So we take these building permits, and throughout the year we're going out doing field work to check to see if this construction is done. And I didn't say anything, but if you guys have questions as I'm going, just, just speak up. So Kelly, real quick, that so page three and four, the that's actually done in that um, the APEX software. The sketch is APEX. Okay. This is the SNA. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, they're attached. Okay. Them. Yeah, first time I've seen one of those. That's kind of neat. Okay, so um, we take the permits and the field, and then cards, and go out in the field a couple times a year until we see that the, the construction at that particular place is done. And then we take photos. We bring the information back to the card. And something important to know is tax day is December 31st of every year. We have, to we have to assess things as of that day, the status of that property that day. So if it's a partial construction, we have to take that into consideration. If it's an act of God, meaning tornado, fire, anything like that, we have to pull off the value based on what's there. And um, once the appraisal is completed and done, we in our system, we get an assessment for it. All right, so there's also lots of, oh, sorry, slow down. Page four is a, is a sample of a building permit. This is for one of the uh, apartment buildings in West Town, Leonard and Wilson. Okay, documents, we go through, we have to process a lot of documents. Um, whenever there's transfer of ownership occurs, there are two documents that need to be filed. One is a deed at the Kent County Register of Deeds Office, and they make sure that we get a copy of every single deed that, from Walker, so they share that information with us. And then also a property transfer affidavit needs to be filed. And then um, and they have to, the, those come to us. And then if it's a homeowner's resident, their main resident, it's, they have to file the principal residence exemption. This alleviates 18 miles of school operating tax. And that also has to be a file with us. And I've got some samples of those forms. Page five is a deed. This is for a little uh, shop. It's for River City Auto and Transmission on Remember Scroll. And then page six is a sample of the property transfer affidavit. And then seven is uh, to rescind, to take off the PRE so the previous owner would file that at the time of sale. And then page eight is the principal residence exemption. The new person would file that if they qualify. <clears throat> All right, so we have to do a land value study. And it's based on a two-year spread of range of sales. And for uh, the 2019 assessments, it was from uh, April 1st of 2016 through March 31st of 2018. So the sales are lagging behind for what the year value that we're trying to create. And um, you, you, in the land sale, you'd like to use vacant land sales. Those aren't easy to find, especially in neighborhoods that have been there for a while. So what I do is I take the improved sales and assign 25% to the land value. So then I adjust, adjust the land based on that number. And um, uh, land values typically go up. Where, uh, uh, where improvements depreciate and go down sometimes, but the market can change that. Land values are almost always going up. All right, economic condition factor studies so uses the same range of sales, the same date range. And in a residential class, we have 68 residential neighborhoods. So they're all studied individually. This process takes a long time to do ECF studies. And then we have one commercial and one industrial neighborhood. Um, and what the ECF study is, is it takes, it takes the recent sales, removes the land value, and then compares the remainder, which is called the building residual, to what the, what the cost manual says that the building should be, and it creates a ratio. So we're getting a ratio for every sale. <coughs> Excuse me. And then that pile of sales, like say Chesterfield Heights, probably has 50, 60 sales for that time period, so you have a lot of information to work with. And that number is what tells you how much that neighborhood should increase. Okay. 
Um, personal property. First we do a canvas, me and Chris go out and do a canvas every year, it usually takes a day or two. And you just drive up and down the commercial industrial corridors, making notes of new companies, companies that you no longer see their signs, that kind of stuff. We bring it in, she put enters that stuff into the, this is Chris Trotter, deputy, I serve my life. And she enters all that stuff into the system so that we have new parcels for these personal property. And then um, this is a self-reporting tax, meaning that these, these companies fill this form out themselves and there's, there's a way to, to check it, but you'd have to go into their books and do that kind of thing. And people are going to be happy about that. But it, this is a self-reporting tax. <clears throat> Just a second. We have about 1,500 personal property parcels, and um, there are three types of forms. Personal property has changed a lot in the last few years. So um, pages 9 through 12 is the traditional personal property statement. Lots of information on there. You can get there's places to put like lease information. You can gather a lot of information on this one. And then a couple years ago, in the changes that the state made, they came up with a small business property tax exemption. And this is page 13. And this is for businesses that have less than 80,000 true cash value of property, personal property. Did I explain what personal property is even? I skipped that part. It's all machinery, equipment, furniture, fixtures inside of a business. So they have to pay taxes on all this stuff. So this, this small one came about a couple years ago. And they used to have to file it annually, and this year they just switched it to, once they file it, it's in place. So we won't have to deal with those, not a lot anymore. And then pages 14 through 17 is what we call EMPP, Eligible Manufacturing Personal Property Statements. These things are pain. <laughs> but we get through them, and they have to be manufacturing something, so they're, it's not a large percentage of them. So after the personal property is done and we've done all these studies, then we do the assessment change notices. This is what everybody, every property owner gets. At, it usually comes in February, beginning of February, mid-February. And this also tells what your assessment is, what your taxable value is, what your class is, if there's a transfer on the property. Um, and it also tells you how to appeal to the March Board Review. So that sample of that, and it should be your own, is on page 18. So next comes board of review. We have three different times of the year for board of review. There's March, July, and December. March is the big one, although the last couple of years it hasn't been hard. We've had like a dozen appeals. We don't get a lot lately. But um, March is the one that folks can come in to appeal their assessment before the board. The board is three homeowners here in Walker, three taxpayers. Um, if they provide evidence to support their opinion of value, more than likely they're going to persevere. If they come in with nothing, they're probably not going to get any more. Um, July and December board of review is for correcting errors and mutual mistakes, so that's a pretty light one. Um, so that was the assessment cycle in a nutshell. And there's also a lot more things that we have to take care of. Oh, again, skipping ahead. Page 19 and 20 is a board of review petition. That's what they have to file for the March board of review to appeal. All right, so... Michigan Tax Tribunal, Tax Tribunal Appeals. After board review, they can appeal up further to the state level. And there's, a, there's small claims, which is normally the residential ones, and that's handled locally. They, they always set up hearings in Penn County so that we don't have to go that far. And then there's also entire, entire tribunal appeals. Those are the, <clears throat> the big ones, the commercial, the industrial. And we have an attorney, Ingrid Jensen from Clark Hill, I've worked with her ever since I've been in the office. She's awesome. She handles all the paperwork for the entire tribunals because it's a lot of legal paperwork. And typically in a year, we typically, typically get about six or seven appeals. Back in the 2008, 2009, when the market was really bad, we are getting 25 to 30 appeals a year. And right now, currently, I have no open appeals. No, I'm not. I'm so shocked. <laughs> and um, just we just closed our March 4 review a couple months ago, and I still don't have any for 2019 yet. I, I, but there's, the deadline is until July, so kind of end of July. So I might get some. Who knows? <clears throat> All right, the next thing I want to talk about is exemptions. There's 
more and more exemptions are popping up all the time. Um, the first one is the industrial facilities tax abatement. I call it 198. That's just the number at the state level. Um, pages 21 through 28 is the application. It's a lot of paperwork for an IFD. And we're getting fewer and fewer adults, too. And I think that's because of the changes in the personal property. The industrial personal property is slowly going away. And commercial is still going to have to pay personal property tax, but industrial is slowly going away. So if we get an IFT anymore, it's more for a new building kind of, kind of thing. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, the next exemption is a disabled veterans exemption. That's page 29. We've got 38. I think I have a 39th one. I'm the new guy. Uh, one that I have to put through our next order review. 38 in there, so they're always getting the, they have to be 100% disabled, so we're, I guess the VA is giving people more and more of that status, so they're popping up more. Um, the next one is a poverty exemption. That's page 30 through 34. These, we haven't had one of these in a couple years, have we? They're, they're poverty. We get them, but they don't normally qualify because it has to meet the federal poverty guideline, the, the threshold, and most people are making more of the money than that, so they don't qualify for it. Uh, the next one is um, just a general property tax exemption. This is one set for, for educational, religion, charitable, that kind of thing. So we get more and more of these. And I just updated this form because it's going to be at the next few months. 35 through 38 is for the property tax exemption. Page 38 gives us a list of the documents that we would need from the company, and then they have to fill out the whole form. And I typically run exemption, exemption requests past Ingrid because she knows all the laws and ins and outs and things that are latest at the tribunal, so she's a good one to take it by. All right, and then um, pages 39 through 44 is a current list of all the properties that are exempt in the city of Walker. Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. um, on those exemptions, is there anybody, like how would people get assistance in filling out those forms? Can they come to the assessor's office for that, or is that something they need to have done? For the poverty one? Well, that or the disabled, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. How, how do they I, I help the disabled vets. I help okay. them. But when, when, the disabled, when the disabled vet when first comes in, there's a list of paperwork that I need from them, so I make sure that they know what they're looking for, and if I have to find their deed, I can find it on Kent County. So they, I, we help with that. The poverty, we often help with the poverty. The um, general property one, they're on their own. They usually have lawyers themselves to do that kind of thing. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. So you'll see from this list, um, the first couple pages are all pretty much uh, city or government related, city, county, state. And then towards the last couple pages, you start getting into individual like um, businesses and stuff. Gerald R. Ford Council, the Boy Scouts, the railroads are exempt. Now, we just had Spectrum Health, the, um, the station on Alpine, that was made exempt just in March. And then a lot of churches follow that. So. Okay. Now I want to talk about um, property splits and combinations in a minute. Uh, we get to 15 to 25 a year is typical. Plats don't count because that has to travel down through the state to come back to us. So. Um, any kind of property split or combination has to go to Kent County map, property description of mapping. They are the keepers of legal descriptions, maps, and parcel numbers. So they would do the actual split there, and then when they're done with their part, it comes back to me, and I have to do the split on our system, and then allocate the values to the new parcels. And page 45 is a property division request, and page 46 is a combination request. All right, so this, the State Tax Commission also requires us to do a five-year reappraisal, and that is where we're seeing one-fifth of our residential properties every five years, so we're taking a chunk every year, so we're seeing roughly 1,900 parcels a year. And the first couple times they did it, they were going door-to-door. -door. This that last time, pretty much this whole last time, They've been working on this questionnaire, which is page 47, and we've been getting a good response to this. A lot of people have turned this back down. And this is just to verify the information on their property if anything's changed. 
I just want to make sure our cards are as accurate as they can be. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. So um, when this came through my neighborhood, my a lot of my neighbors were quite suspicious. <laughs> they tend to be. They tend to be. So can you like how, how would I explain that to somebody like what it is that you're doing with this farm? We have to be fair and equitable, and so a lot of, like I'll give a finished basement for an example. This this is one that happens a lot. They'll build a new house. They, the, on the permit, I won't have finished basement, but a year or two later, they'll finish the basement without pulling a permit. Um, it, you have to look at it this way. Is it fair that we're assessing this guy here for his basement, but not this guy over here that has a finished basement? So to me, it's always a fair and equitable thing. I, I don't think you're ever going to get people on board with that or to not be suspicious about it, but there are a lot of people that cooperate. So. Good. Good. All right. Thanks. All right. So... Um, Along with the five-year rear appraisal, we also I print off MLS sheets every couple weeks. I go in here and see what's listed for sale, and that's um, 48. A lot of information on these things. We update our cards a lot for these things. And then to go along the same line of the five-year reappraisal, on page 49, this is a parcel from the Apex Sketch conversion project. And what Apex is our sketch software I told you about earlier. So the blue line is, the, is our sketch, and it's laid over this house, over the aerial on the house. And if you can see in this bottom corner, that's a wood deck that we didn't have. And our mapping stuff is so slick, you can go into the side, and they have a measuring tool. You can measure all the way around that house without leaving the desk. So we, we, we pick up stuff through this Apex sketch conversion thing. And then there's also a pictometry change finder, which is... Sorry, 50 and 51. And this happens to be um, Padnos down on Turner. And this is from the old one. Chris just started working on the new round of this. But it compared the 2009 aerials to the 2014 aerials. And it pointed out everything that was either new or gone. Padnos had five or six buildings back in there. It didn't pull, pull them in. So Tammy was still in the... And, uh, community development time at that time when I went down I said look at this Tamian she called him up and made him get permits <laughs> alright so um, I'm almost done um, I also do a lot of annual reports top 10 tax prepared. oh wait did I skip one sorry AMAR a AMAR is the audit of minimum assessing requirements and this is done by the state tax commission they, they come in and review Kent County's being done again in 2021. The first one was 2015. They review our records to make sure we're doing our job properly. And on the first round in 2015, this page 52 through 54, I only got we only got one thing wrong, and that was some adjustments that I had on land. I didn't have any reason on it. So all we had to do was send them a letter saying, this is what we're going to do to fix it. This is the time frame I need to fix it. They're fine with it. <clears throat> and then page 55 through 58 is the next email. So we know what's coming. We can get everything ready, get it all prepared. I, I, and here is the um, poverty exemption, it, it questions that. So we recently updated not poverty, property, property tax exemption. So we've, we've updated some forms so that we're compliant with that too. Um, all right. Now annual reports. So I do four top 10 taxpayers lists. This one that you see on page 59 is for Walker as a whole. I also do one for each of the three school districts. School dis districts need it for something in their paperwork, but those are online if you want to. I, I have a lot of this stuff online on our website. But you can see Myers is a huge one for us. I also do the statistics, which is the next three pages, 60 through 62. It has a lot of inf in interesting information on there. 61, I just wanted to point out, I, I do a calculation for the average sale prices of homes. If you look in 2005, it was 165000 And then at the lowest, in 11, it was 126000 Now we're up to 214000 for our average home price. Um, IFT report, the 63 and 64, this is due to the state on October 15th, so this gets done in the fall. That's all of our IFTs listed on those two sheets. Um, there's Red Zone, which is page 65 and 66. 
These are all get, these will all be expired by 2024 is the latest, last one, but they're all starting to slowly expire every the last three years that they're on, they're, a quarter is taken off, so they're slowly getting back into paying on coal tax. That came into place when the economy was down and the industrials were suffering because of the economy being down, so we brought that into play. Um, this is a personal property report, but I don't know what that's like. Uh, assign addresses. We assign addresses, Chris does that, to any kind of plats or splits, so we have to assign new addresses. Um, and then finally, the budget. We're a small office, we have a small budget. Um, not any big ticket items, nothing expensive. Next to our salaries and insurance and retirement, the legal fees are our, hard, our highest line item, and even then we don't use most of that half the time. So, um, All right, and I just wanted to introduce you to everybody. This is me and my husband, Terry. And, um, my duties include commercial and industrial properties, land value studies, ECS studies, MTT appeals, March border review, exemptions, budgets, splits and combos, reports, AMR prep, help with um, residential and personal when they need it. This is Chris Trotter, the deputy assessor, and her husband, Juan. She's our residential person. She handles July and December boards, boards of review. She does the IFT applications. She's our main personal property person. She handles all that. She handles all the documents, deeds, the PTAs, the TREs. She signs addresses, helps with building permits, helps with a five-year appraisal, helps me with small claims appeals when needed. And this is Rachel Nix and her grandson. She's our assessment specialist. She handles a five-year reappraisal, building permits, <coughs> helps with residential, helps with personal property. She sets up the and schedules the March board review appeals. She scans and attaches all of our documents so when we pull up a parcel. Everything's right there. Um, she does the filing. She's the main contact person. And that's it. Any questions? Any questions? Kelly, I thought I seen our esteemed judge in the back of the room. I thought after the court presentation, we couldn't raise the bar any higher. This this is pretty darn good. So um, outstanding. You know, one of the things that um, um, I learned about Kelly is the um, her certification and the investment that she's made in um, her trade, her craft. Um, there she is a very in a very small select uh, group that is a level four certified in the state of Michigan. And there's like 130 of us. Um, and that's it in the state. And to think that we have her here and uh, you just look at the smoothness and we learned something with the sketch uh, um, the APEC software tonight and it's pretty impressive. So um, I can see why we do it as well as we do. We appreciate all your efforts, Christina as well. And um, um, really it, it, it uh, for a city that depends on this as much as we do, that information, um, it's definitely above and beyond uh, uh, performance you deliver back to us. I want to say thank you on behalf of the commission. Thank you. So, thank you. Kelly. Commissioners, anything else? Good, Daryl. Right, Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, Kelly, quick yeah. question for you on the pictometry project. Didn't you do some stats uh, the first time we did that to see how much value you added to the role as a result? I probably have it listed somewhere. Okay. Great. How much? I also have stats on since we started the five year reappraisal every year, how much we're having value for that. Okay. So I've got this. Yeah, I didn't look at all the stats, but the investment for the pictometry was what, $10,000 that we paid over mm -hmm. three years for, for us to be able, have that availability and to add that much to the role. It's just that simple of a, of a program that they can do at their desktop. That's awesome. This, so. the, this is our BSNA program that we do everything on. This is my house. I love the markings real quick. But um, it has all kinds of information in it. And we bring this in here for border review. We have a border review in here. So I have all this stuff at my fingertips so everybody can see what we're working with. It's outstanding. Thank you again, Kel. Thank you. All right. It is uh, 7.01. We'll give our deputy clerk a minute to uh, get things in order.
we'll let you, uh, Jess, we'll let you roll through that, Commissioner Glanville. If, actually, you want me to wait a second, Jess? Or? No. Okay. We'll go ahead and we'll, uh, we'll call the meeting to order. And um, I would like to ask Commissioner Glanville to do the invocation, please. If you can bow your heads. Holy One, known by many names and beyond all names, spirit of life, spirit of love, spirit of community, spirit of justice. We're grateful today for our many abundant blessings. We're grateful for our first responders who give selflessly to protect and serve the community. We're grateful for life itself, for the measure of health we need to fulfill our callings, for sustenance, and for friendship. We are grateful for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honor of bearing appropriate responsibilities. Please grant us, our city officials, our mayor, and this assembled council wisdom, courage, and grace to govern amid the conflicting interests and issues of our times with a sense of the welfare and true needs of our people, a keen thirst for justice and rightness, confidence in what is good and fitting, the ability to work together in harmony even when there is honest disagreement, and that we may find personal peace and joy in our task. This we pray in the name of all that we hold sacred and holy, all that we hold good and right and true. Amen. Thank you. I'd like everyone uh, to invite everyone to stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we are. Sorry, you're, you're doing good. For our guests, we've been having a little challenges for a couple of weeks now with our eye compass system, so we're getting there. I see you in the house. We'd like to uh, uh, ask you and Elena Heisinger uh, to come up to the uh, podium for the swearing in of our newest commissioner. take pictures. Um, uh, Miranda is there helping us out with things and uh, um, Jessica I know you're multitasking so we'll get you. Is it better? Um, yeah perfect thank you. Okay. And then can we make sure Elena has got the right spot perfect. Awesome. Yes. 
and then Brandon, what we'll do is we'll get a couple of family pictures real quick. Go ahead. And then after that, we'll take uh, after the family pictures, we'll take a quick picture with the new commission. And then um, Judge for Sluice, if you'd be so kind, we have Dr. Taylor here being sworn into the planning commission. I see him in the uh, back of the room as well. So we'll get a two for one here. I see you in the back of the room. You can't hide. Yeah. Commissioners, if you want to come down, we'll wait right here. We'll get a picture down there with her. Grandpa, Grandma, I see grandparents, so come on up.
Um, and then next on our agenda is swearing in of um, Dr. Joe Taylor as our uh, newest planning commissioner. Uh, Judge for Sluice, I believe we have the sheet right up in the book up there. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, actually, real quick, as Judge is doing that, uh, I asked the clerk to call the roll. Sorry, I jumped down. Okay. Mayor Carey? Present. Commissioner Kent? Present. Commissioner DeShane? Present. Commissioner Heisinger? Present. Commissioner Groders? Present. Commissioner Glanville? Present. Commissioner Gilbert? Present. Okay. All right. You got everybody done. We're awesome. Yeah. All right. Your Honor, the floor is yours. Everybody knows Dr. Joseph Taylor? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Might have delivered a couple in the room, possibly by yeah. chance. Dr. Joseph, you raise your right hand to take the oath. I, Joseph Taylor, I, Dr. Joseph, Joseph Taylor, do solemnly swear to support the Constitution of the United States, support the Constitution of the State of Michigan, and to faithfully perform the duties of the Office of Planning Commissioner for the city of Walker, and to invest in my beliefs to help me God. How do I say it? I do. Taylor, okay. congratulations. Each of us want to shake your hand and say congratulations. Sure. Welcome aboard. We also have the range agreement uh, with the police department that has been uh, updated. Um, lastly is the City of Walker and City of Grand Rapids cost sharing agreement for preventative maintenance of the North Park Bridge over the Grand River. Um, are there any questions or dialogue around these items? Uh, Daryl? Yeah, with Scott and uh, Greg both here, I asked them to come and give you a brief update. I know they provided a memo. 
We have Greg's probably up first there on the range agreement and give you a little bit of background. I think will be helpful. Um, okay. to answer some questions real brief. Okay. Good to see you. So the, uh, I, I think the memo made it to you, uh, and what it is is accumulation of many, many years, and I was able to, to research back 11 years when we had the first written agreement with the property owner down on the, on the uh, range. Just for those who don't know, we're down on Butterworth Street, right at the Grand Rapids Walker city limit to the east, to our east, I should say. Um, so we've enjoyed the, the facilities and the property down there for, I'm going to guesstimate, probably 20, close to 20 years now because uh, we uh, had the range when we transitioned over to the automatic weapon systems, so it's a good 20 years probably. But I could find, I could find documentation going back 11. So what we've done is entered into an agreement with property owner Beekoff Properties to maintain that facility as our firearms range. And uh, as such, it's getting used quite a bit, uh, both by us, but it also gets used by a lot of our partners, whether it be law enforcement partners or non-law enforcement that are related, such as the Grand Community College Police Academy is, the, is by far the uh, most frequent user of that uh, facility down there. We have Brinks uh, Armored Car that uses the facility, and then uh, Spectrum Health. They uh, have recently started arming some of their security personnel, so they, they have the uh, need to do that. Uh, fire or the uh, qualifications, and now we are also been asked by uh, Meyer Corporation. They're going to be bringing some armed security onto their property, so they need a facility for that. So we started doing a little bit of research and figured out that the majority of the use of that property is by outside agencies other than Walker. We're down there a couple times a year, once in the spring, once in the fall, and we may be down there for a couple of uh, SRT shoots or special, special response team shoots, but by far the majority of the use is, is outside agencies. Over the 20 years, a lot of the property started to deteriorate. We we're getting some pretty major sinkholes down there. Uh, the asphalt started to kick up now and uh, we're starting to see some uh, fencing that's starting to drop from the trees, and so, et cetera. So a couple years ago, we, we entered the, uh, the idea of doing some improvement down there after a deer line met with the property owner back in the summer of 16 to confirm that our agreement would still be valid and stand strong for the many years in the future. He, uh, Doug Meekoff did assure us that the property is ours. He has no uh, intentions of doing anything with us before we bring more money into it. So what we wanted to do is just update it, make it safer, uh, for those that are using it and then bring it up, nothing uh, significant other than just putting some new asphalt pad down, filling in a lot of those sinkholes. But uh, as I mentioned, as we started looking at some of the scheduling, we noticed that uh, a lot of the, uh, the usage was outside agencies. So I did some research, figured out that uh, Grand Valley State University uses uh, Wyoming's firearms range and they pay them $3,000 a year to use it. Uh, and they use it on average about 11 times, I think it was. So it comes out to be about 270 some dollars per use per day. Um, we did not charge anything for our range use. So my, my, my rationale is, is if we're going to put money into this to improve it, which we need to do, the cost should be shared by the, the users uh, that are going to be using it. I've had offline conversation both with Spectrum Health and Meyer uh, corporation and they're both both those companies certainly on board with it because you're not going to find another range uh, for my, my proposal is $250 a day to use that range. Uh, my, my goal will be to take that money in and continue to use it for property maintenance, upgrades, uh, whatever else needs to be done money-wise down there, whether it be uh, new fencing, uh, new, new uh, asphalt at some point in time, and then also we also go through a lot of uh, target uh, uh, backings, etc. We make those out of wood though, so the expense, the big expense is just going to be getting it up to speed, uh, tearing that asphalt up, bringing in some fill, sink, filling in those sinkholes, and then putting a the level of uh, asphalt down on there. So uh, I had our range master, uh, Sergeant Bean, do some research for me. That's where I discovered that the biggest users are Grafts Police Academy. They use it on average about 10 to th uh, 13 days a year. Uh, and they're usually using it in the middle, uh, February, January and February now, switched from the fall to to winter. Next uh, is Spectrum Health, and they use it to anywhere from seven to ten times a year. And then Brinks uh, uh, Armored uses it to less than that. And then of course Meyer is coming on board with us. So the usage is going to be pretty pretty consistent with what we've had so far. We control the rules of it. Uh, we do not allow any after dusk shooting down there. So if you should get any complaints down there, third work commissioners, that's not us. We shut that down at dusk. 
I think what's happening is a lot of the, the uh, noise is carrying from uh, Wyoming and Grand Rapids, which is right across the river. Uh, but we ensure that there's nobody down there shooting after dusk. And then we also are very concerned or uh, concentrated on no Sunday shooting. So we keep it quiet during the weekends. Uh, uh, Saturday afternoons is the latest that it's getting used by that academy. So that's how we got to where we're at. We had some conversation there all night as far as you know what is the most logical way. We've had this agreement in place, the one the uh, proposed agreement that I've forwarded to you. That's been in place for many years now between us and Grand Community College. The only thing we did is just added on a fee to it now. The rules and the agreement language remain the same. It's just that we are now proposing that we start collecting some fees for usage uh, of that facility to maintain the monies to stay in the facility for improvements and whatever else uh, is needed down there. Our, uh, our uh, equipment and our ammunition comes out of our budget still. This will be simply for any type of uh, uh, continued improvements needs. Uh, we're not considering building anything permanent down there. We have a garage down there right now. And our shoot house is comprised of plastic barrels, which actually works very, very well. So the, the cost will certainly be just for maintaining what we're going to get to, and hopefully we'll maintain it for another 20 years. Good thing. Commissioners, any questions? Pretty cut and dry. Anything else, Daryl? Yeah. Well, just related to this, the first resolution that you have on the agenda after the consent agenda uh, is asking to grant the authority so when we have these requests come in that I can sign those instead of bringing each one to the commission because sometimes they come up midweek or you know at, at any point. So that's what that first resolution relates to, exactly what Greg's talking about here. So if there's any questions on that, <coughs> Greg's here as well. But that's that really just going to save us some steps, save you some agenda items. Okay. Good here. Anything else? All right. I'm just going to say, 250 a day seems to be pretty inexpensive. Yeah. You know, for the for the day. So I think it's, I think it'll be a win-win, and it'll help maintain it. I hope. Yeah. And this has been in conversation for quite some time. We're just trying to figure out a way to make it. As, as Kelly was saying, equitable and fair to everybody that uses it. We just didn't want to throw a, uh, a fee on it no matter if you use it or not. So now we've decided if you want to come and use the range, it's yours uh, under our rules, under our control, under our schedule. But the cost is going to be on you if you're a non law enforcement entity. And the reason we did not non law enforcement, to be quite honest with you, is there's a lot of quick pro quo going on with our uh, law enforcement partners. So when we have a presidential visit at uh, Delta Plex, we have every law enforcement agency in Kent County come out on their time, their money, uh, supporting us. So we do the same. It's kind of a give and take. We use Kent County's indoor range in February, and we don't get charged for that. They don't usually use ours too often, but sometimes for longer range, uh, longer range weaponry, they'll come down and shoot their rifles down on ours. Makes sense. All right. I think we're good for most. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next on the list, the uh, City of Grand Rapids, City of Walker, caution agreement for preventative maintenance of the North Park Bridge over the Grand River. Connors. Uh, another easy one, I hope. Um, we uh, own the North Park Street Bridge with Grand Rapids 50-50. Uh, you might remember that a couple years ago we were uh, having some discussions about the condition of the railing and the lampposts and things. A lot of the paint was coming off primarily from the railings, and we had put some money away for a project to work on that jointly with Grand Rapids. Well, um, they took it a step further and did some inspection work on the bridge to discover some other things that are um, a little harder to see for the uh, common driver that's going over the bridge. But uh, the bridge also needed some abutment work, and uh, they applied for a grant from the, the state's uh, grant fund, bridge grant fund, and were successful in getting that. Uh, so we've been able to combine the railing work and the abutment work into one project and actually save us a little bit of money because I think we were planning on fifty to one hundred thousand dollars for railing repair, and our number at this point is forty thousand six hundred forty-seven, and that includes all of the engineering and inspection and all the other work that goes with it. So, pretty straightforward. I think the the more confusing part of the agreement is that it includes some work that Grand Rapids is doing on two other bridges. So when you look at Exhibit A, it also shows costs for Ann Street, Bridge Street. Um, we can kind of disregard that because it is part of that bid project and so they wanted to make sure that the exhibit was accurate. Commissioners, any questions? Would, 
probably a guess be they threw all three bridges together to get a better price? Correct. That's good. Yeah, and I think to your point, Scott, the um, what we had planned on this caught me that this was not something that was a surprise. We knew this was coming from our newer commissioners up here. So, probably long overdue. This is a good job. You guys did a good job on this. I mean, Walker doesn't have nearly as much invested as Grand Rapids, and um, something we need to do. And they've done a really good job taking care of us with this bridge because they, they're, they're staffed more to handle a big piece of infrastructure Absolutely. like this. So they're, they're being a good neighbor. And they're going to be administering the whole thing on our behalf. So right, it's wonderful. Even, it's even better. Yeah. Although I was an inspector when this bridge was built, so I do have a little experience. I was mostly crying as they swung me on the crane back and forth for years. How long ago was that? It was a long time ago. <laughs> All right. Uh, any questions, commissioners? Any questions for Scott before we let him let him out the door? I think we're good then, Scott. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, so we'll entertain a motion for the three items on the consent agenda: expenditures in the amount of four hundred ninety-six thousand seven hundred thirty-four dollars eighty-nine cents, the Walker Police Department range agreement that we just reviewed, as well as the City of Walker and City of GR cost sharing agreement for preventative maintenance of the North Park Bridge over the Grand River. I'll entertain I'll make a motion. A motion, Commissioner Gilbert? I'll support. Support for Commissioner Glanville. Any other conversation? All, right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passed. Consent agenda passed. Thank you. Right next on our list is Resolution 19-523. Um, Daryl, I know I'm aware of this and in, in, in support of this for my role. Um, we got a little background color behind that. It's going to save us some admin time. Exactly. Pretty cut, right? Pretty straightforward. Yep. yep. So um, basically, that resolution is just uh, allowing Daryl to sign the uh, delegation of the uh, limited of four authority to contracts, what have you. Um, I'm very comfortable with that. Range agreement is a perfect case of that, that we're not coming back uh, multiple times and uh, delaying things. So um, any dialogue or questions on this? Um, just a clarification. Is this only as it applies to the range agreements? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion for approval then. I'll make that motion. I'll support. Motion from Commissioner Kent. Support from Commissioner DeShane. Any other questions or dialogue? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Resolution 19-523 passed. All right, next on our list, Resolution 19-524. Um, to appoint Elena A. Heisinga as third board city commissioner. You still have a chance to run if you try. <laughs> You're good. All right. Well, uh, I'll uh, entertain a uh, motion for support. I'll make that motion. A motion for Commissioner Groders. Uh, do we have support? I'll support. Support Commissioner Glanville. Any other conversation? Uh, I'll take a vote. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passed. Resolution passed. Next on the list is Resolution 19-525. Basically what this is, commissioners, is um, for, um, I think, believe um, in the best interest of uh, Commissioner Heisinga and ramping her up um, with the background as she learns the role is I just reappointed her to um, recommending reappointment um, to replace uh, former Commissioner Holland on the exact same boards through the end of the calendar year and then we'll evaluate at that point in time um, where, uh, where everybody will be at. So um, that is all that is. So the appointments are just replacing um, again former Commissioner Holland and I after speaking with our clerk, I thought it was best we have that in the form of a resolution just to keep uh, um, things clean. So, um, any questions or dialogue around this? I'll entertain a motion then. I'll make a motion. Motion, Commissioner Gilbert. Do you have support? Support. Support, Commissioner Kent. Any other conversation? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Resolution 19 525 passes. Um, next on the list is ordinances. It's our second read of ordinance 19-646, amendments to the marijuana and related ordinances. Um, I don't even need, think we need to bother the chief with this one. Um, this is our second reading on this. So I'll ask the commissioners first. Any questions on this one? All right. I'll entertain a motion for approval for the second reading of this ordinance then. 
I'll make that motion. Motion for Commissioner Groders. Do you have support? I'll support. Support from Commissioner Glanville. Any other conversation? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Second reading of Ordinance 19-646 is passed. Next is the second reading of Ordinance 19-647, the Amendments to Consumer Fireworks Ordinance. Um, again, we've had uh, some conversation around this, some clarification. I think we're good and up to speed on this. Um, any other conversation uh, around this ordinance? Yeah, um, is this the one um, that doesn't mention marijuana? And I thought we were gonna have that in, or we don't need to, I don't know, I forgot to really about that. Okay. I, Chief, did we need to add that in? Uh, the recommendation was what I forwarded to Yes, in the email. email. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Her recommendation was to leave as is. Oh, okay. Because uh, I should, to, to make it simplified, if you start identifying certain controlled substances, yeah, that's if right. it becomes a non controlled substance, we're coming back and I'm going to do that. Okay, got it. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Good question. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? I'll entertain a motion for approval. Make a Commissioner Glanville, I have support for Commissioner Ken. Sure. Um, uh, any other just conversation around this ordinance? Uh, we have a, pro or, uh, a motion for Commissioner Glanville, support for Commissioner Ken. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Ordinance 19-647 passes. Uh, next on the list is Ordinance 19-648 to add Section 94-39 to the Code of Ordinances entitled Mullins Avenue Precise Flat. Um, we've uh, definitely gone through this one uh, um, with a fine tooth comb. Any other conversation, discussion around this? Okay, I'll entertain a motion for approval. I'll make that motion. Motion for Commissioner DeShane. I support it. Uh, support for Commissioner Groders. Any other conversation? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Second reading of Ordinance 19-648 passes. Um, also in your packet, you have the, have the Department Monthly pet Reports Packet. Um, I'm sure you all had a, a chance to take a peek at it. Uh, definitely some good stuff going on in the, uh, the departments. Um, um, Scott's already left the room when looking through the engineering department packet. Um, he is definitely getting, uh, put him, Travis, and Rachel put some hours in right now. So a lot of good things going on. So that's for your review. Um, any other public comment? All right. Um, then we'll jump to Mayor, Commissioner, and City Manager comments. Uh, Daryl, welcome back from Poland. We can start with you then. Oh, thank you. Uh, really just a uh, Trying to finalize the budget in anticipation of the uh, public hearing and hopeful adoption at the June 10th meeting. So, working on finalizing that and catching up on uh, things that I've gone last week. But you guys kept everything rolling and in good shape. So, uh, I think everything you more welcome to Elena. Looking forward to you serving as our newest commissioner. And Gary, you're going to talk about fire equipment. Mr. Walsh? Uh, Wednesday, 5 o'clock, Ordinance Committee will be discussing changes to potential changes to the liquor license ordinance and then a policy for quota licenses. And um, just so you know, the folks from the Fire Post have been invited to that meeting. So more on Wednesday. Thank you. Commissioner Kent. Well, well said. <clears throat> the traffic's a little heavy on Waldorf now and then with the construction. <laughs> you okay? We expected it. So we're good, thank you. Commissioner DeShane. Um, tonight, um, we had a youth commission meeting and we discussed the uh, upcoming Memorial Day Parade and the had a year in survey. And um, the leaders of the youth commission are going to be revamping this committee over the summer. And a big thank you to Commissioner Glanville for her wonderful brainstorming session with our group and hope that we'll have more to follow. Thanks, Carol. I think we're amazing. Thank you. And then I'd like to just take a second to say, Welcome, Elena. You did a great job interviewing. I get some very strong candidates. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you, and I think that your civil engineer degree and your planning commission background is going to be um, an asset to this commission. And I'm also pleased that we decided to add uh, Joseph Taylor to the planning commission because he's been a lifetime resident with a lot of time on his hands as of late, and uh, this was going to be a win-win for Walker. 
And then I thought, thought the assessing department, although she was very nervous, she did a good job. That was a really robust um, uh, presentation and um, talking through it and then taking the time to make it personal. Uh, to have our own homes on there, kind of interesting and fun to follow along with that. Yeah, a, lot of, a lot of good information, a lot of good statistics here. If you have a chance to look through some of that stuff, a lot, a lot of good stuff. It is, it is. It takes a little bit to digest, but it's kind of nice to, yeah. to have that to go along with. And then lastly, I just was, when I was reading the um, staff updates, I noticed that our clerk's department was working with the assessment department to kind of do a check and balance on um, capturing all the businesses, and I really like that camaraderie. I think that's something that we don't always see. I think it's really good that, that both the departments are reaching out. So kudos to you guys, Jess. That's great. That's it. Commissioner Heisinger? Um, thank you. Thank you, and I look forward to serving with all of you guys. Commissioner Groders? Uh, I was uh, contacted by the uh, Standale Reform Church, and they're doing a community garden. They oh. asked me to come and, and uh, yeah, and engage with them a little bit, and they're doing an educational piece with students or something, and working with them, teaching them gardening, and it's right up my alley, so I was, I was excited to, to learn about that. So, and welcome, Elena. Thank you. Michael? Um, yeah, to piggyback on that, the, um, the Emily, did she come to mm -hmm. you? Yeah. So they're going to have a uh, kind of a grand opening. So I encourage them to include us in that. So if you can maybe also, yeah, I'll probably make that invitation. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I was at the traffic committee met this week. Nothing major. There's a few minor, um, you know, issues related to residential street traffic and parking, but nothing outstanding. Um, an update on Wilson and Richmond. Um, we are in the grant window again, so that I believe they said that grant applications will be due in about um, six weeks or so. Um, some residents had asked about putting up some no passing signs there. MDOT was not in attendance, so we didn't really discuss that because they would be the ones, of course, to handle that. Um, I was also at the Waste to Energy Advisory Committee. We're done on our work for the budget this year. Um, we did make a recommendation on the tipping fee, which is going to raise it by quite a bit, um, and that's the amount that really generates the bulk of the operating revenue for the um, incinerator. Um, they did a really nice job, our boss, um, in negotiating a new price with Consumers Energy, where we're going to be getting right around $86 a kilowatt hour for the next 20 years. Um, we had to update that a little bit early in order to let like get that price, but it's a good uh, amount above what would be normal. Um, and it was really smart because um, electric energy use is dropping, so the fact that we're locked in on that price for 20 years is a benefit to the county. Um, the other thing I think we need to look at as a city commission is just the sheer volume of trash that's generated. It continues to be an issue. The incinerator is operating at well over capacity, and it has been for some time now. So we talked about like what are some of the education and outreach things we can do as a city. Um, and one thing that I was unaware of is that at the uh, Recycling Education Center, which is just over by the Coca-Cola plant, they actually have boxes of like flyers and brochures and things that we can get for free. And it would be really nice to maybe put those out at some of our community events. Um, I just thought, you know, something we can do to help people recognize um, how they might be able to generate less trash uh, because we're looking at how we can, um, I mean the price, we're going to end up paying more for waste removal in some capacity, in some way, right? That tipping fee gets passed on. Um, and so they're looking also at how we might be able to, if it would be pertinent to enter into a countywide blended trash um, program, which means everybody would have recycling and um, waste removal, and then also maybe possibly reviewing the Six Cities Agreement and considering how we might include townships in that, so there's a little bit more shared cost, um, because populations have changed significantly since that agreement first went into place. Um, but those are, you know, not things that we as an advisory committee advise on. <laughs> we talk about those things. So um, it might be nice for us to reach out to county commissioners, um, 
take a look at what's going on there and just give your thoughts. Um, you know, or ask how we can, you know, how we can do a better job in Walker. Um, you know, we get in a lot of side conversations there. One thing that I never thought of as an issue is mattress disposal. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. They're really big, um, and they can't be burned, and they can't go anyway. You know, things like that. Like, how can we deal with that kind of trash removal? So. Um, and then the last thing, I was at the um, Lower Grand River uh, Organization of water sh Organizations of Watersheds. Um, on Friday, they had their spring forum over at Blanford. And I just want to call out our engineering department again because I was really excited to see Rachel and Scott there as leaders in that group. Um, they're actually chairs of some of the subcommittees. I know Scott, I believe, is a past president. So, um, you know, they're very active in that. So I thought that was pretty exciting. Um, again, going back to this idea of just increasing awareness around some of the, what I like to call low-hanging fruit, things we can do to help keep the, the watershed clean, uh, maintain that, um, and there's some real simple programs like Adopt a Storm Drain, where people can just pick one on an interactive map, and then that's your storm drain, and you keep it clean. <laughs> so so some, some simple things that we might be able to promote. Um, I've also been approached again by, or increasingly by some residents asking about the River Waterway Project. Um, and some people at the forum are asking me where we stand as a commission, um, especially given that Granville voted on it last week. So that's top of mind for a lot of people. Um, and if we'd like, I have a, the contact for a gentleman at the Michigan State University Sea Grant Extension Program, which is education and outreach around water quality issues, um, fisheries, things like that. Um, he's done some very good balanced reporting around um, the Grand River, the health of the Grand River, and um, what dredging would look like um, from a pretty balanced perspective. So he would be an opportunity if we want to follow up and get some discussion. I, I would. I get a lot of people asking me about that. I think that would be, even if we did it in a small little group, just to get a half hour of this time to just educate us a little bit. Well, we would have, I mean, we have opportunities during our, our 6.30 time, if, if appropriate. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little, and as I shared in the conversation, my position's not change. I, I think for us to take a position right now is extremely premature, and, and I have two reasons for it. Number one, um, the testing, sediment testing, is not done yet, and it's in process. So it might be all for not of, of us taking a position because we could be in favor of it and find out they can't do anything as a result. Um, so that, that's one. And then the second thing is, I think when it comes to really from a jurisdictional perspective, we have no control of the waterway. If the state wants to do it, the state's going to do it. So our, our symbolic vote, I almost feel it's it's uh, um, energy I'd like to ex expend elsewhere at this point. Um, without us getting too far into the weeds. But that, that's where my position is right now. Um, I think we, if we can take a wait and see attitude yeah. here as we get closer. So I'm not suggesting that we vote on anything. I just n thought it would be useful to have more information on the project. And I know a lot of people have asked about it, so I right. just think if we could... I think if, we, if, if that's if shared, that would be helpful. If there's a presentation... Um, I just want to get educated on it. Right. Um, and I think that that is a great resource that Carol brings up. And I agree, we don't need to make a stand, but it's hard to make a stand when you don't know, I guess, enough about it. Well, it's, it's, it's that there is, um, um, there's factual information on both sides of it. And then sometimes you could get caught on, on one side, and we know whichever group it is. And it's hard to make an objective fact based decision. Everybody says, here's the facts. And I mean, right. really, if we can have both sides, we come to our own conclusion. Um, so I'm, I'm all in favor of that. And then um, I think with that, for me, the, the one caveat is really what I'm waiting to see and, and watching what I, I, I'm still, um, I don't think we would have got to as far as we have on the Grand River, what with the restore of the rapids, if it was as bad down there as it is upriver. Um, but again, I don't know what I don't know. So I'm making yeah, assumptions that are really not fact-based. They gave an update on the Restore the Rapids project too, and that's actually been scaled back a little bit, um, a lot in, due to um, some of the the um, ecology, like the endangered animals and things that's like that. Right. Um, they've had to re, you know, rethink that project along those lines. Yeah, Carol, they, for like the entire time that they've talked about the Restore the Rapids stuff, there's been so much discussion around what, what species that you're kind of keeping yeah. segregated from one another with the current layout and how they were going to 
face those challenges. Because I remember when I was interning with the city of Grand Rapids in like 2013, we were talking about that. And like here we are six years later, and Still uh, same conversation. So yeah, yeah I do remember it. <laughs> I mean, we, we know that there, there's going to be an impact to some things. What mm -hmm. the impact is, we don't know quite yet. But right. yeah, it's interesting. It's a good dialogue. So okay. Well, we have a lot. I mean, the we're sitting on a pretty big chunk of the watershed, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be good for us to know, just as a commission too, as we look at development, as we're working on the master plan, what are some of the things we need to take into consideration? In regards to that, can okay, look and this is to the uneducated map measure here. Um, I think I came up with about seven, somewhere north of seven miles of Grand River Waterway that we had. Is that sound about somewhere in that neighborhood? So yeah. significant. Mm -hmm. And then if you count Indian Mill Creek, that's another. Place. Exactly, which has become a uh, very thriving trout. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean it's. Um, and that wasn't always in the best of shapes. Right. Yeah, she's so, done a lot of work around that. Yeah. So. All right. All right that's well, all we got. Oh, except no. welcome, Elena. <laughs> I'm just going to say that uh, with, the, with the EPA handed down the Wolverine, should answer a lot of those questions. Yeah. You know, so, but uh, I also think, too, that if there's any educational things we can do for recycling, mm -hmm. you know, um, to get it to a meds or something. You know, a lot of times it'll come through the schools, but yeah. not not always. So but if there's something we can do to it's always good to get that information out, I feel. Because we're not really on a sustainable course right now. <laughs> you know, that's I think we can all could, could you know come to that conclusion. So all right. Good anything else? No, nope, I'm done. Okay. Oh, good. So good dialogue. Commissioner Gilbert? Yeah. So, um, Planning Commission met on Wednesday. Um, another good meeting. Elena's last meeting. Sad to see her go, but look forward to her contributions here on the City Commission. Um, a couple things that we'll see coming along on the ordinance side, because that meeting was centered around moving some of the many ordinance pieces that we've been working on. Um, that committee has been very busy as well. Um, we, we have the sign regulations coming through, so um, increasing the frequency because we had some uh, pretty important characters who were out of, uh, out of compliance with that frequency, um, including some on this site. <laughs> um, we had the uh, clarification in our ordinance of uh, storage capacity requirements. Um, it was written in a way that was pretty um, unfeasible, I would say, so they kind of tapered it back to what the implications were intended to be of that ordinance. Um, and then we had let me take a look. Uh, Standale signs, so the, the sandwich board signs and regulating the way that those are placed in our uh, Standale district. And then I believe the other one that we moved forward was um, regulating and defining our solar energy systems on site. So for like your uh, different parcels, how we're uh, permitting solar systems, your uh, solar panels, things like that, uh, making sure that we're allowing for it, but that we're keeping it regulated in a way that makes sense. Um, so all those coming down. Um, the other stuff that we did that I've done this week, um, we had a uh, rapid board meeting. Um, lots of interesting stuff there. The rapid's going through a comprehensive operational analysis. So we're going through reviewing um, the current service levels, kind of what this region is better suited to, and kind of seeing where where we can take ourselves from where we're at now to where we probably want to be. And that's a, that's a six-year planning model, um, which in my mind is a very short window, but you know, we're, we're used to operating here. <laughs> um, so we'll see uh, the fruits of that hopefully in the next year, um, hopefully some calls for service in some different regions, maybe Three Mile Corridor. Um, and then the, the other item uh, from the rapid meetings is that the Laker Line is having the groundbreaking um, in a couple of weeks, June 3rd. June 3rd. Um, and I believe they sent invitations to everyone for that. Yes. So uh, hopefully see you all there. Can I ask a question about the planning commission? Yes. Was, was the master planning group going to be coming to our planning commission meetings? Do I remember hearing that? June. June. Okay. That's when I remember that starts. Okay. Thanks. Our deputy clerk, and first and foremost, thank you for navigating us through <laughs> our technical challenges tonight.
I have to apologize for that. We are working on uh, fixes, and we hope to be up and running as soon as possible. My face would have been a red your sweater with all those things, which you did well. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, congratulations, Commissioner Heisman. All right. Good. I'll uh, home stretch here. Um, welcome, Elena. Obviously, we've covered that. And then uh, Kelly and Chris are gone, but um, we would have paid this job. And this is... Uh, um, I know that the idea for this came from multiple sources. I just, uh, um, I, this group really doesn't care what, who gets the credit for it, but I just, I, I think this is it's another example of, of bettering our education, understanding our departments, so we can help support them and um, appreciate the, the detail that they, uh, that they give. So, um, meetings attended, Commissioner Gilbert mentioned the, uh, the board planning meeting, the Lake Line update. Um, I sent everybody an email with a picture of the stops. I included our department heads. Um, that would be uh, somewhat effective so you can see those. They're not small pads. Um, they're 60 foot pads, so uh, they're definitely good in size and I think will make a positive impact um, to our retail environment at Standale. Um, uh, also, one small little thing is um, um, we started discussing this. I went back to my notes about a year and a half ago. It was a uh, covered shelter out in front of City Hall, and uh, somewhere along the line, um, uh, visibility was lost sight, and probably in a CEO transition at the Rapid. It's something I'm pretty passionate about, and had a uh, conversation with our CEO uh, at the meeting last week, and said this is at the very top of my list. And uh, while we continue to look at improving um, uh, service uh, coverage levels in our city, something as, as simple as that, um, I don't want to drive by and see somebody standing out in the middle of the rain in front of our, our city offices. So um, I think the, the message is heard loud and clear there. Um, then uh, hosted two groups here last week. One is um, um, we've been doing a little bit more at the Grand Rapids Chamber. There's some more leadership in uh, uh, roundtable conversations. I think just the Walker Chamber doesn't have the resources for. Um, so I'm a part of a, a year-long uh, roundtable program um, and uh, so hosted eight leaders here last week, uh, just right down on the table down here. Um, different backgrounds, different vertical industries, and I share it only because the um, pretty proud of what we do here and was able to share from a um, City of Walker perspective the, uh, the health and vitality of the city and all the things that uh, we have going on. And then um, for those that uh, might have seen the, the shameless plugs on social media, I actually had a, a group of the Zinsers School kids through here. They got to meet the unofficial city mascot um, Wednesday morning, I think, they were at PD. And um, uh, Shannon is very helpful, so we have a little fun with uh, with the kids in here, and uh, just one of the cool parts of the uh, of the job. Um, upcoming things, I uh, want to prematurely wish Commissioner Gilbert a happy birthday on Wednesday. <laughs> Wouldn't think I'd let you off of, off the uh, and seeing how we don't have a meeting until June. Somebody else turns 29 on the 31st of May. I'm telling everybody. It's okay, 35. so that's good. <laughs> so happy early birthdays, both of you. Um, knowing we have Memorial Day coming up, and uh, just a reminder, the parade next right. week, and uh, be prepared for that. Um, next Tuesday, when we come back from the break, um, the mayors have uh, started to meet a little more frequently now around the Census Count Committee. Um, that is going to be something that's extremely important for a number of reasons to our city. Um, I share it only as I come back and get more details I'll, I'll provide to you. We've been um, fairly introductory so far, but uh, speed's starting to pick up here. Um, and uh, that's going to be very important to us in um, getting an accurate count next year. But there's going to be a lot of needed communication engagement at a local level to make sure that we, we don't miss anybody. So um, more to come on that. Um, community engagement June 3rd. This is our former Community Relations Committee. And just to restate that, um, Lena will be replacing uh, uh, Commissioner Holland on there. And the reason that, again, we changed that name is Community Relations Community Engagement. We're looking not just to, to host an annual event and, and pass out some, some trophies. We're looking to engage our, our community, whether the residents or businesses further. So this is part of that broad encompassing um, you know, we're talking about um, the great idea of the Youth Committee and reshaping these committees. Um, and this is kind of the start of that, of just making sure that it's 2019. Are we being, are we relevant right now? Are we accomplishing what we need to do? And looking at the, the mission and the purpose of each of those. So um, more on that one. Um, employee lunch next, or two weeks from today, or two weeks from this Wednesday on June 5th. 
Um, if you've not been to one of those before, please do uh, make an attempt to come. I would highly encourage jeans and casual clothes because um, last year, what was it? It was like 85, 90, I swear it was hotter than heck out there. We were serving ice cream. cream. No, I was eating the ice cream while I attempted to serve it. So, um, but that's good. If you can come on to that, it, it is from a, a spirit of, of camaraderie and um, kind of the spirit decor that, that takes place between um, this body and our, you know, the, the rest of the employees of the city. Um, that's that, that it, it's a simple, uh, simple investment. Um, it starts at, I believe, noon. Um, if you're there a few minutes early, uh, that's great. Everybody comes over pretty much at noon, eats. Um, and I, I really like, even last year, how the, uh, the commissioners actually sit at different tables. We're now all clustered together. And um, I know we enjoy one another's company, but I'm more impressed by the fact that we, um, we get to know people at the, uh, the different departments. So um, definitely, if you can make it, it's, it's a good thing. Um, and then I think last, um, last couple of things here. The um, On the fire uh, uh, piece, obviously we have a um, announced retirement of our fire chief effective June 30th. Um, one of the things I met with our city manager and HR uh, director this afternoon, and one of the, the approaches I'd uh, like to suggest, I mean obviously we all know at this point we have a retirement coming up, um, you know, not just not too much more than a month from now. And after meeting with them, um, we came up with a couple ideas I'd like to bounce off the commission, just kind of get general consensus from everybody here. Um, we have, because of our succession planning initiatives that we've had in place for um, a few years now, um, we've developed that next generation of leadership for, for many, if not um, all, of our departments. And one of the, the things that sticks out with fires, we do have some good internal candidates um, that have indicated a strong interest in um, in that position. Now, say candidates, because we don't know if it's one, two, um, it could end up being five or six, we just don't know at this point. So, what we discussed this afternoon was actually opening up, we already have the job description that was done uh, a couple of years ago when we split public safety back out into two separate departments um, to be more strategically aligned to the mission of each. Um, so, we have the job description. Um, conversation we had today was posting that later this week, maybe as late as Friday, maybe a little bit earlier, and it would be up for two weeks, internal posting only, right now, and then when we get to the personnel committee meeting on Friday, June 7th, we would know at this point who our internal candidates are. Um, at that point, um, personnel committee will be meeting, and um, we could decide at this point, do we um, move forward with just our internal candidates, or um, do we need to look at, at opening this up externally? Um, I really want to stand by the succession planning piece, and I do believe that we do have um, um, a good pipeline, if you will, in here, particularly with uh, fires, we're discussing it. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see us work that process, um, have that open for two weeks, internally only right now, um, and then um, also to coincide with that, um, we'd like to do something within the fire department because we have a lot of people, um, sometimes voices we don't get to hear from that, that I think are really important. So um, one of the, the discussions that we had today was how do we make sure um, those affected have a voice in that process? And it's sometimes, uh, it's sometimes tough to have that conversation. Well, this is going to be my boss at some point, or um, you know, it's going to be the chief. And we want people to have that ability to, to give feedback on what they're looking for in that, that new chief and uh, um, any other feedback that we may need to make an effective decision. So what the idea that was put out there was they have a survey monkey, um, maybe maybe no more than five questions, keep it very simple. Um, it would go out to the paid on call firefighters as well as the um, regular full time uh, within the department. Uh, we would focus just on fire right now, not, uh, not outside the department. Um, run that for that same couple of weeks, get some needed feedback, get our internal applicants who we believe that we're going to have, and then what the suggestion that, that uh, we all collectively came together uh, with is um, we then bring that back to the full commission and uh, go through that interview process we just did with our appointed commissioners. And we've seen how we've gone through it twice in the last few months. We've gotten pretty good at it. Um, 
I don't know if I'm um, after thinking that, you know, just having personnel make the decision and, re and recommend in there. I think we all have some skin in the game on this. It's an appointed position. So however you cut and dry this, it's going to come back to the commission. And I just, uh, we collectively felt that this is the, uh, the best way to go so that everybody has a voice in the process. So long-winded way of saying two weeks internal posting to see what we have internally uh, put in, which we ex are expecting. And then second is get feedback from the entire department on what are you looking for, what's going to be important, because I'm not going to confess to know what's important to um, a guy working out of station, guy or gal working out of station three, um, what's going to be important to them, and I want to hear their voice. So, commissioners, questions, comments, feedback? I have, I have a comment. Um, I like the survey monkey, and I like it that you're going to keep it to uh, a limited amount of questions. I'm not sure what they'll be, but I think it's it's really good to have that stay within the department because there might be some perspective from a coworker saying, hey, you know, this person might not have, does, a, does a better job at this or really excels at this. And, and I know there's a lot of talent in there, and um, I think we do have, I think there's a really good chance that that will be an internal candidate that takes that position, but it's kind of nice to get the perspective of everybody that, lives, that actually works in all the different stations because they interact with the current chief and may know um, maybe a, to make our job easier by by um, letting them ride the, the right one rise to the top. Again, I'm saying it that well, but nope, you get my gist. Mr. Ken, I saw you reaching. Yes. Well, I've been thinking more than once, but uh, how many positions do we have in the city that are appointed? All right, did we have all this process for the police chief two years ago? Uh, I guess what I'm looking at is all of a sudden now it's fire, we're going to do it different again. Same, same old thing. I think, no, Dan, it's actually, it's, we, keep in mind, we split to two chiefs. So you can't, we're, we're, we're right now excluding fire from that conversation using that police example. That's not right. I mean, you had two departments that we did the same thing for three years ago, whatever it was, three years ago. We did the same damn thing. So it wasn't just police. It was police and fire we did it for. Yeah. I guess in the past, we, you know. I know. The, the we never done it this way. And to me, it's, you know, I, to have 52 firefighters had to say who their boss should be or shouldn't be, you don't ask, you didn't do that with DPW. Should Gary be the boss or not be the boss? We're going to put it on monkey, or we're going to do the survey, and we're going to do. No, I, I don't. I, what I'm saying is, there's no, there's no protocol so on how we do it. We're just going to up. Oh, I think we ought to do it this way. It's fire, and we're going to do it that way. So I don't feel right. Dan, with um, BBW though, I feel that Gary was the was the best candidate for you for DPW for that natural succession there? Oh, I didn't interview him, but... Um, nor did I, but... Through succession planning, you know, that's why we have it there. Now we're going to go... For, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. We're going to do an end around and put somebody else in there. That's all. No, but we're doing a... I'll put money on that one. We're doing internal. This is internal we're looking. So that to me says that we have the more superior candidates within. We're not putting a posting outside to to other uh, applicants. We're keeping it within Walker, and those are the people who have the most the most uh, experience with the city, with our equipment, with our residents, with our our footprint, everything. So I think that this is this is good. Um, when you look at the role of uh, the next two people in in position after Bob, they're pretty new to those positions, right? I mean, well, one was on on the police department, then he went to the fire department. He's been there a long time. Went to school. But I mean, I just, I just remember being a yeah, commissioner. I just remember him just recently, like as of a year ago, being 
uh, pointed to that position. So. Right, because okay. he had to go to school and complete it. We didn't change his job description like we did for other people. Oh, okay. That's why it took so much longer for him to do it. Okay, so. He had to go through the class. Well, and get the degree here's how I look at that. Happen. I look at that like in, in the private sector that I deal with on a work, work day is that sometimes it's just good to see the feelings and the feedback from the department within fire to see that we are putting the right person in. And that's going to help us. That's going to help you and I make a better decision. We want someone robust in there. We want someone to be a leader there for a long time. We don't want to have to keep having this turnaround. I think we got the right people to pick as candidates. We just need to prove that out. Can I clarify the survey? It's my understanding that the survey is for us to collect information on the types of questions we should ask. It's not asking the fire department personnel to recommend somebody. Is that correct? No, no the, the intent is not to, to, to advocate or not advocate okay. for an individual. Right, that's what I thought. The, it's just to find out what are the qualities. Well, what's what's important to them? I mean, and, I, and I think that the, the spirit and intent here is, is to get that feedback because feedback's been given that maybe we're not listening to what, what they want and what they what they need. And um, I just, I think it, that, I think it's a great opportunity as part of the process to do just that. Well, I mean, as a new commissioner, I don't obviously have the history of the city, you know, but I recall what we did five years ago. I think, in my opinion, I think this is a good process, kind of the way things should be in terms of how you go about hiring and appointing. And I understand we have succession plans, but you still need to kind of put it through that final, is this the right candidate? I mean, you might have thought of somebody you wanted to have in that succession seat, but that doesn't mean they panned out to be the best candidate. And it's worth it to our fire department to look at the internal candidates that, that we have, I think. It just feels like the right thing to do in terms of, if you look at it objectively, of how to go about hiring. Yeah, they, <laughs> they, I, I definitely value what you're getting at there, um, in that we're kind of pivoting the process. Um, but to that point, I think that I, I would have more questions about the way we've done it in the past and would hope that we would trend more towards something like this moving forward. Because I, I think that we there there's justification to say we haven't been thorough enough in our process for other departments in the past and we need to, moving forward, really do our due diligence of going through these steps in these important leadership roles within all of our departments as opposed to reverting to practices that we've done in the past because that's how we've done it in the past. That, that would be my feeling on this because I think that, and there is a different nature to our two public safety departments and the way that, to the point of the survey monkey uh, part of it, um, getting feedback from that that level because we have so many employees at that level in those two departments. Um, getting feedback in that way kind of makes sense to me. Um, but generally speaking, I think that doing the process this way gets us more towards kind of the way that I would like to see us review significant appointments like this in the future and kind of getting away from a process of just kind of moving the the person that we decide is the right person forward, and that's kind of my thinking here. Well, I don't think it, <clears throat> but I feel that, uh, like Daryl and Frank, others would have input on it, but whatever. It is what it is, but I think <coughs> we can get too involved in such things. Also, so that's why it's important. But that's why how I look at it. If, if I could make a suggestion, I would suggest establishing a policy for doing this moving forward. This is part of our conversation here. Is the um, it is one of the things to the point of what in the past of cleaning up things that have been done, and I think to even um, um, the company I just left in February was with for six and a half years, 
um, you're on that little fast track and, and you get promoted. I still, we were a privately held company. We had to post the job. Um, I had to go through an interview process. It was not handed to me. But, the, I mean, I was <coughs> groomed for that job for well over a year in advance, almost two years in advance. And then when the out opening came up, um, it had to be posted. We had to do, we did it only internally. We did not do it externally. Um, so that's a private company. Um, held to some of the same st HR standards. I mean, there's still um, policies and procedures you have to follow. I think as a public entity, that, that transparency that we have to, you know, that we have to have, we're at least satisfying that with the internal posting. We just can't appoint somebody right to a spot this day in 2019 um, without some liability through. So we have to go through a process. If we end up appointing a, um, if there's a succession of two goes to one and three goes to two or whatever it may be, then so be it. But we've at least done that process and satisfied the requirements that we have. And the public also that we represent at this point says they've done the due diligence, they've done their process, and that's it's been fair and it's been consistent. I would say going forward it is going to be consistent. We've talked, this is what the process is going to be. Um, and right now I don't have that. If you could see, um, Dan, the commissioner policy manual that is sitting back on my desk, um, probably 30 to 40 different tabs and there are changes of things that are outdated and we've done things a certain way that we just from a, a policy standpoint as policy makers um, we've got to clean those things up and I know that uh, speaking with both of the previous mayors it was on their list of things to update but they just never got to it and on that list of, of things that we try and do every day in a part-time role this is one that um, just lucky I had a little bit of time to be able to spend towards it, um, but I almost feel like I'm behind now because I told Shannon I had it done a month ago, and we've talked about it as a commission uh, recently. So for me, I think it's it's um, um, we're taking steps in the right direction. This is not an isolated thing. This is going to be a new process coming forward. We will be consistent with it. So um, I'm seeing general consensus, but I'm going to kind of go around with, uh, um, I'll start right to left here, process as described. Yeah, I, I, I would like to see this be the way we approach all of these moving forward. Understood. Yeah, I would uh, second what Stevie said. I agree. Okay. Agree. I feel it's too involved. Disagree. Okay, fair enough. So, majority here I have, so let's, um, Shannon, if you would, let's, the posting is, as we're able to this week then, we'll run it for two weeks, and then the intent is uh, um, um, we can work out the final details on the communication to the commission once um, uh, we have closure on that date, and uh, we'll be at the personnel committee meeting on the 7th anyway, so we'll know then what Did it is. Did we get to see the questions before they go out? Um, I think um, there was something Shannon did volunteer to take off the plate today of um, mm -hmm. uh, her and Emily are going to work on it tomorrow um, a bit and uh, look at some benchmarking, some best practices. Other entities, other cities have done this, other departments have done this, um, so we're going to see what else is out there and benchmark to that and then uh, um, tweak and adjust to, to what we need here. So, all right. Okay, that is all I had. Anything else for the good of the order? Yes. I have one request, and I think I mentioned it last year at the luncheon. If you could have the employees wear a name tag in their department, oh. um, that would really make conversation a lot easier. And especially then, I recognize the name, or the, the, the name would get imprinted on my brain, and I remember a visual. That's a good, especially the commissioner, that's a good call out. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I think on the flip side of that, good for the commissioners to have their name tags and write their thing on as well. Maybe we can just write our name after as well. Okay. All right. Good. I will, uh, without further ado, then on our journey. Yes. I forgot one thing. Gypsy Moth update. Oh, yeah. 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 Continue to, continuing to monitor the hatch, our consultant is, and we don't have an exact spray date yet, but he's thinking it will probably be the end of next week or the beginning of the following week. So once I have that date, I will let you know. We'll post everything on social media so that everybody will know when the helicopter will be flying around. Very as early as maybe next Friday. 
depends on the weather. It's all weather dependent, and they may do different areas of Grand Rapids at different times, even though there's four different communities that are being sprayed, just depending on how the hatch is going. So. I saw that map looked pretty aggressive for the spring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. And uh, just a small note, while um, our chief's in the back of the room, is I was sitting in the uh, um, was in the uh, the garage yesterday working and um, heard all the sirens coming out. Um, had now heard the police sirens first, and I heard um, fire coming right after that. As they were at the station, took off to the uh, uh, crash on Wilson, and uh, we were notified for what it's worth, probably in about five minutes from the time of the, uh, um, I think the initial dispatch, the call out uh, for everybody. So um, again, we, we appreciate all of that, and whether it's you or Chief Walker, I mean, we're, we're hearing what's going on on a pretty timely uh, basis, and that's a significant improvement from years past, so uh, we appreciate it. Did everybody get it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I, heard the, I heard the sirens, and you heard a whole bunch of them going, and then um, my phone was sitting over on the, uh, the uh, metal countertop over there, and I heard a buzz, and walked over, and I saw the, uh, the 293 uh, number, so it came, yeah, came through quickly, so appreciate it, but All right, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn them. Welcome to the email. Okay. I'll make that motion. Okay. Motion for Commissioner Groders to adjourn. Support? Support. Support Commissioner Gilbert. To all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you. Good day.